So welcome everyone to the Cornell Environmental Law Society and Water and Land Use Clinics 2011 Energy Conference, Gas Drilling, Sustainability, and Energy Policy, Searching for Common Ground. I'm Ben Tettelbaum, Conference Chair. Uh, thank you all. If you're not from Ithaca, you have joined us on a beautiful, typical Ithaca <laughs> afternoon. So thanks for being hearty and coming out. We hope you join us uh, for the rest of today, certainly, and tomorrow. We have a, a great program lined up for you all. If you look in your physical programs in your folder, we have numerous gracious sponsors for this conference. Uh, they also have some booths over in Myron Taylor Hall. We encourage you to explore those when we transition there after our events in Annabelle Taylor Hall. And I just want to mention uh, one of our largest sponsors, the David R. Atkinson Center for a Sustainable Future. Uh, ACSF is a vitally important center at Cornell that works across disciplines and is truly invested in sustainability both locally and globally, and they're quite a growing program. Uh, speaking of the future, uh, nothing less than just that is what's at stake and at issue at this conference, both regionally and on a national and, in fact, international level. Sustainability, perhaps, best captures the focus of these next two days, of anything in the title of our conference. We're going to explore that via discussion, debate about energy policy, particularly through the lens of shale gas development. Please note that this conference is at Cornell Law School for a reason. The law is woven into the fabric of our society. And like it or not, lawyers often know how to make its operation functional. That also imputes to us and our profession a responsibility to make it sustainable. The Cornell Water and Land Use Clinics work with the community and with the region to make that duty a reality. If you see value in this too, then the Environmental Law Society urges you to remain involved and help us to further environmental and natural resources law programming here at Cornell Law School. Uh, as we said, if you were at our community forum last night, uh, we want for these next two days to cut to the heart of the issues at this conference. Uh, and I think our panelists last night did that quite well, and we're going to try to continue that for the next two days. Uh, they're packed with phenomenal speakers uh, who've given us a lot of their valuable time to join us from across the country uh, and also right here at Cornell uh, for the next two days. We know the phrase common ground uh, can be contentious in and of itself, and so you could insert a question mark at the end of the conference title. But we've worked hard also to ensure that at least common ground means gathering together at the table multiple sides of these important issues. That said, we request that you respect each other and each other's views that will be spoken today. We, res we request that you respect all the conference volunteers who are graciously giving their time to help out and make this event possible. And of course, we request that you respect all of the panelists coming from any side. We're fortunate to have a research institution like Cornell uh, where we can host an event such as this, where we make it academic, but the academic issues are substantive and have practical consequences for our world. So again, we ask that you respect everyone in that forum and hear out multiple sides of the debate. We also hope to keep this conference free and open to the public in the future. To that end, we have a number of donation stations set up over in Myron Taylor Hall. And if you feel that you can, the Environmental Law Society would very much appreciate any donations that go directly to this student-run organization. So without further ado and cutting more to the issues, I'm going to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Susan Christofferson who is a professor at Cornell, and we're very pleased to have her with us today. She's the J. Thomas Clark Professor in City and Regional Planning at Cornell University, 
received her PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. She's an economic geographer whose research and teaching focus is on economic development, urban labor markets, and location patterns in service industries, particularly the media industries. Her research also includes both international and US policy-oriented projects. Her international research includes studies in Canada, Mexico, China, Germany, and Jordan, as well as multi-country studies. In the past three years, she has completed studies on advanced manufacturing in New York's southern tier, the photonics industry in Rochester, the role of universities and colleges in revitalizing the upstate New York economy, and production trends affecting media industries in New York City. She's written more than 50 articles and 25 policy reports on topics in economic geography and economic development. Her current projects include studies of Phoenix Industries in old industrial regions, and most relevant to today, a comprehensive economic impact analysis of natural gas drilling in the Marcellus Shale in New York and Pennsylvania. Professor Christofferson and her team have already released a number of policy reports from this study, which can be found at greenchoices.cornell.edu. Please help me in welcoming Susan Christofferson. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be able to give a talk without a PowerPoint, <laughs> um, which I think is much preferable. And I'm very happy to be able to speak to an audience that is composed both of my colleagues at Cornell and uh, Cornell students and of people from upstate New York, from communities that have real concerns about these issues. Um, I think that, th and this is very ironic, uh, one of the positive sides of this issue and the interest it's generated is that it has really enlivened public political debate and action. And I was just at a, a meeting in Watkins Glen in, on Wednesday and gave a talk there to 150 people and I am just thrilled to see uh, people interested in uh, the issues that are uh, they're confronting both obviously environmentally, but also economically in, in upstate New York, because that's my passion in life. Um, now, I want to tell you a little bit about this project and that I'm working on. Um, I'm going to try to talk more generally about what I think are some of the key questions that we need to think about when we think about Marcella Shale uh, drilling from a, an economic development perspective, but I want to frame this a little bit more broadly in the hope that it can give you some questions to ask during this wonderful conference. And, and I want to thank the conference organizing committee uh, particularly, and, and the Environmental Law Society, and particularly Ben Talbom, who I think if I ever need a lawyer, he's going to be it. <laughs> <laughs> Because of the um, the care and the care to, and attention to detail that that has characterized the this conference and it's been very impressive, um, the research that I'm presenting is is quite unconventional. It's uh, funded by the Heinz Foundation, Heinz Endowments, and the Park Foundation. It really isn't conventional. Uh, academic research. It's really more in, in the order of an investigation of what some of the issues are uh, and an attempt to go beyond the economic impact reports that have provided almost the only information on the economic consequences of uh, Marcellus shale gas drilling. Um, and the, and uh, the foundations also are very, very interested and concerned with public education. So I think that um, this investigation, uh, and I'm going to present some of the results from it, um, is, is really an attempt to widen public discussion and bring people some ideas, some ways of thinking about Marcel Shell gas drilling, um, not only in the environmental sphere, but in the economic sphere. Uh, as Ben mentioned, our results are being presented uh, on a website, www.greenchoices.cornell.edu, which you can 
find by Googling me. And uh, we're, we are looking at a series of topics. Um, as all of you know, um, environmental issues are at the center of questions about the Marcel Shale gas drilling. Um, and my talk will bear a little bit on, on environmental issues. But um, because so many speakers in this conference are concerned with environmental issues, my perspective is really going to be about uh, how we think about this in terms of the, the uh, economic development side. Now, um, I want to talk a bit about what we've learned by investigating this issue. And this is somewhat directed at my uh, academic colleagues because um, this is a very frustrating subject to do research on. For one thing, it's about everything. Um, it's about transportation, it's about land use, it's about uh, the police, it's about population growth, it's about, you know, and everybody says, why aren't you studying that? And so it's a, it's, it is about everything, particularly if you're taking if you're taking the approach which we are, which is really an investigatory approach rather than a conventional research approach. One thing that we've learned over the course of doing this research, which started last June, um, is that there are still very large uncertainties about what's going to occur with Marcellus shale gas drilling, both environmentally and economically. We really don't know about the long-term risks. We don't know uh, what level of drilling will uh, increase our environmental risks. We don't know who will bear the risks. And uh, so I think that there are still very, very serious limits to our knowledge about what is going to occur. Um, the research results on Marcellus shale um, activities, drilling and, and uh, the boom-bust cycle, are, are very limited. We've had to rely on qualitative methods rather than quantitative methods, um, partly because the evidence we have is very recent. There's, there's not, there aren't longitudinal uh, studies, and because uh, what we've had to rely on is information from different shale plays in the U.S. and the data that they have is uh, based on how different states, whether it's Wyoming or Texas or, or Pennsylvania, how they regulate Marcellus shale or uh, how they regulate shale gas uh, drilling activities. So um, uh, I, I, this is a caveat uh, that um, in most cases, what we're relying on is, is uh, uh, qualitatively uh, based data, interviews, gathering comparative information, um, with one exception, and that is with regard to trucks. <laughs> we do know a lot about trucks um, um, because uh, Cornell has, for example, a local roads program, which I have to admit, I've, I've uh, worked at Cornell for 20 years. Every year I would get that local roads program brochure. And I would look at this and I'd think, local roads, why do we have a local roads program? Isn't this just a waste of money? Okay, the local roads program has come into its own. <laughs> we now know why we need a local roads program. They have done some excellent work on showing what is actually going to happen and, and ha uh, measure with the uh, impact of the um, transport uh, to wells, well pads, and of um, uh, produced water from well pads. They've, they have really done yeoman service in, in telling us what, what's going to happen in very um, quantitative ways. But as, apart from that, it's very difficult at this point to have the kind of data that we need to do uh, longitudinal analysis uh, of, on specific topics. Um, and I would, uh, one topic that people are very, very concerned about um, is uh, monetizing the um, effects of uh, environmental changes, air pollution from the trucks and compressor plants, for example. And um, um, again, if any of my academic colleagues would know, to do that kind of research 
it requires longitudinal data. It requires very, very specifically scientifically derived hypotheses and, and probably at least a million dollars. So even though we know that these things are important, um, we're, ha we have, we're, we're in a position in our project of just going with what, what we can, what we've got. Okay. Now, I want to talk for a minute about what's new about hydrofracturing and what's not. Uh, there's a long history of natural gas drilling in the Marcellus region. Um, the first well in the United States was in Fredonia, New York, um, part of the, the wonderful era of innovation in New York State. It was made out of wood, apparently. <laughs> and the co first commercial well, uh, natural gas well, was in Pennsylvania. So. Um, there's a long history of natural gas drilling in, in New York and Pennsylvania, uh, and even vertical natural gas drilling, shale gas drilling, is not a new technology. What is new about this, uh, there are a couple things. One is uh, that the capital intensive technology that's being used and the volume of water need to uh, extract uh, tight gas. Um, I would say that there's another thing that I think we can bring to the table. Um, I think to understand the shale gas boom, we need to examine the market conditions in which shale gas is being exploited and company strategies in response to those market strategies, market conditions, excuse me. Um, I think there's increasing awareness that shale gas drilling has elements of a speculative bubble, but with potentially very serious environmental consequences. Um, the fundamentals underlying the investments in shale gas drilling are, are very poorly understood. Um, I know Arthur Berman is going to be at this conference, and um, he has done a lot of work uh, looking at those fundamentals. Um, there are, is evidence from other shale gas plays of very sharp declines in a very uh, short uh, drilling cycle. So this, it, we, uh, we do have to understand what's driving the companies that are doing the um, shale gas drilling. Um, when we look at the, this cycle, uh, it has four phases. One phase is pre-production, which in involves land leasing, negotiations with state and local officials, sort of setting up the terrain. Um, uh, obtaining the land uh, uh, under which the, the, the resource lies. Then there's the drilling phase, which is the phase of intense activity and the flow of expenditures into a locality. Uh, we see this in Tawanda, in Bradford County, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, a whole series of subcontractors come into the uh, county and in, into, into the well sites. Um, there's an operating firm, but there's, they employ subcontractors, and this creates risks because you're, you're working with many different firms. Um, and then the, the drilling teams who come from Oklahoma and Texas, for the most part, um, move then from well to well. Uh, and and I'll, I'll talk about this in, in a moment. Um, then comes a, a drop. So we, uh, this is where I wish I had some visuals, but I'll try to use my hands. I was remembering that, that uh, uh, commercial where somebody goes like this and then everybody goes out and goes like this. And so maybe um, what you're going to get is very intense drilling in particular localities, one locality and another locality. It's particularly in uh, what's called the sweet spot uh, in most of the, in many of the other shale gas plays, um, the oil and gas companies have really focused on a, a fairly small area. Um, this is why in, in, in New York State, it's going to be Broome and Chemung County counties primarily. But the Marcellus shale play is very, a very complex play. Uh, um, geologically, so it's not clear how it's going to work out in terms of, of um, the drilling 
uh, activity and where the, the operating companies are going to be willing to take risks. This is a very, very expensive, very high risk activity. As I said, it's closer, this industry is closer to being like financial services than it is to uh, manufacturing. Um, they're taking risks. It's debt driven right now because the, um, they, they can't make a profit at $4 um, the, uh, for um, the, the gas prices at $4. Um, and so um, the question is how they're planning and strategizing um, to find wells that are commercially viable. So we have to look not just at the, the geology and the technology, we also have to look at how the firms are thinking about this and looking for commercially viable wells. Um, after the, this, this period of movement of drilling, which will take place in a sequence of locations, um, then there will be a drop off. And um, the drill, drilling will stop. The purchases from, that the drillers made from uh, sandwich wagons and uh, taverns and all that will stop. Those indirect jobs will go away. Um, and th we will have a bust. So the question that we have is, how long will this drilling phase last? How fast will it proceed? And then what will happen in the bust period? Now, if you're interested in the economic side of this, uh, and, and, and what I should say, this, this pace and scale, which is how we think about the pace of, of drilling and the scale of drilling, will then have effects on the cost to communities and, and to the environment. Um, there's a lot of controversy about this question. Uh, you'll hear speakers at this conference who will say this is going to last forever. I read one article from a Pittsburgh newspaper that said, boom without a bust. I thought, boom without a bust? This is a natural resource extraction industry. There's going to be a bust. The, uh, will it last seven years, the boom? I mean, and we could talk about what's going to happen in the boom. Will it, happen, will it last seven years? Will it last 10 years? It's going to go place to place. Um, will it last 20 years? This really is important. So I want you to pay attention to the speakers today when they talk about this and pay attention to uh, what their interests are in telling you how long this is going to last because that's very important. Okay, uh, as I've said, at the core of our research project, when we were looking at how to, how to understand this, pace and scale became our central question. How do we understand how fast this is going to happen and, how, and, and what is going to be the spatial distribution of the drilling? Okay, now if we think about that, I'll just give you some factors that affect pace and scale. Um, transportation costs. Um, the Marcellus Shale is considered to have good economics. It's a favored shale play right now because the transport costs to the major uh, eastern markets uh, for natural gas are, of course, the transport costs are lower. We're, we are the market. We're closer to the market. Uh, current tax policies. There isn't a severance tax in Pennsylvania and, and none projected in New York, and that saves the oil and gas companies um, considerable money. Um, we can have an argument about uh, the local property-based severance tax in New York, but uh, and people on my research team are doing work on that, but um, it doesn't replace a state severance tax, which most states have, including Texas. Um, the, quest, the other question about the, uh, what affects pace and scale is um, the, uh, how the uh, oil and gas companies are, are attracting investors to invest the millions of dollars that are needed in, um, to do this kind of drilling. And, and again, I'm not going to go into any detail about this because Arthur Berman uh, will be here and, and, and can talk about this and also it, um, 
it's something that you should think about, but it's a whole subject by itself. Um, so, for example, there's also competition among and access to capital by natural gas companies. Uh, the independent drillers have been declining in number, and the oil and gas industry uh, is concentrating. And that because the bigger companies can hedge and um, the smaller companies don't have the funds. Uh, rig availability. So there's only so many rigs. Um, that will affect, they'll have to make choices about when and where they're going to drill. Uh, regular, regulatory requirements and capacity. Is the state of New York going to monitor and determine how uh, many wells are permitted? Per, per, permitted uh, during uh, over a period of years, um, are they going to are they going to permit 50 wells a year, or are they going to permit a thousand wells a year? Who is going to monitor those that permits at the state level? That will be a critical factor determining pace and scale. Um, and then a, another factor is um, that makes Marcellus the new exciting play is a decline in other uh, shale plays. The Barnett shale has been decreasing, uh, is showing uh, decreasing productivity. So um, th th that's really just a framing question. If you go away from this talk with one thing, think about that question about the pace and scale of drilling and what's going to um, determine it. Um, but now I want to turn a bit to our research that we've been doing, uh, which is, is more specific to economic development questions. Um, the three questions that we've asked about the economic development consequences are, uh, and, and believe me, these sound very simple, but it's taken us a lot of mental exercises to try to get <laughs> to, to get to these. Uh, because as you know, as all of you know, who, uh, dealing with these these issues. Th this is a very complicated topic, scientifically, economically, environmentally. Um, and also we have at the same time an information glut. So uh, trying to sort through um, information and, and say, okay, what is, what's most important? Okay, the questions that we are looking at in my research project are, um, what are the cumulative impacts of drilling activity during the drilling phase? What are the potential public costs? And I'll go into these in a bit more detail. Um, second, what local and regional impacts are likely with a capital intensive resource extraction industry? And I want to focus here on the regional. We want to get beyond this idea of just looking at the well pad. Um, what is known about the long term consequences for economic development in regional resource extraction economies? What can we? see has happened in other regions of the country that have had resource extraction. Um, the conclusion, I think if the, these are very preliminary, but I think if, if I'm a, in a planning department, and so the question, planning is about anticipation and risk. How do we determine risk and how, what do we anticipate? Um, and I think that the one conclusion that we've come to is that um, in looking at the risks in this region, we need to plan for the short term. We need to anticipate that this drilling phase, when it happens, and I happen to be one of the people who thinks that there is going to be drilling in New York. Um, I'm one of the um, hope for the best, plan for the worst people. You know, this is, I mean, I'm a planner. It's like, I, I don't want, I don't want this to all of a sudden be, happen, and then people say, oh, now what do we do? I want to have um, policies, plans in, in effect. So I think that given what's happening in the Barnett Shale and the Haynesville Shale uh, and what I've learned about the economics of the industry, the, the finances of the industry, um, I think we should plan for um, a very short-term boom-bust cycle, seven years, very intensive. And But we also need to plan for the impact of a regional industrial infrastructure that supports and services the natural gas industry and gets product to market. And that's something I think that's been generally neglected up until fairly recently. 
Okay, um, so I want to say a few more words about each of these. Cumulative impacts, what do we mean about cum by cumulative impacts? Um, cumulative impacts uh, refers to um, the effects of multiple drilling pads in a region or in a locality. If you read the um, environmental impact statement, the draft S guys that the New York State has put out, it focuses on what's hap what happens at the well pad. And um, a, a lot of what we need to think about is what happens beyond the well pad. And I, and I'm, I don't mean only uh, water contamination questions, but trucks, a thousand trucks per well pad, um, uh, the impact on the roads, um, the impact on um, other um, community costs. So what, what has happened in other shale gas plays and what have they told us about these cumulative impacts? And of course, again, this is a pace and scale question because it means that you have to think about if you've got 10 wells, it's one kind of cumulative impact. If you have 100 wells, it's a different kind of cumulative impact. And there is a literature that suggests that communities can adapt to f a 5% change in the demand for their services, but they can't adapt to a 15% demand. And, and then when people talk about the revenue that's gonna come in to, to pay for these uh, demands, um, the revenue is lags. And so there's a question about um, how this is going to happen, and then again, it will drop off. So we have to think about that. So among the cumulative impacts that have been identified in other shale gas plays are uh, the need for accelerated road maintenance. And um, there have been some critics, I show a, a, a set of photos when I give a PowerPoint that shows what happened in a Pennsylvania road um, over a, a year with um, a high volume uh, of, of truck traffic, of, of tanker trucks going along that road. And, and someone said, well, you that isn't fair because that's the effect of winter. And I said, well, yes, we have winter here. <laughs> um, Winter, of course, makes things worse. It makes, you know, some things, well, I, you know, I'm from Minnesota, so when people complain about winter here, I think, hmm, you know. Um, um, this is tropical by comparison. Uh, it's a little darker, but uh, anyway, um, there's tremendous impact on roads. Uh, traffic congestion from trucks and air pollution from trucks. An estimated, as I said, 890 to 1,300 truck trips per well. Now this may change if, if the oil and gas industry starts to uh, recycle water. That number may go down, and is likely to go down, but it's still a lot of trucks. Um, higher public safety costs. Population increases, and there's going to be people coming in from outside. Um, uh, we're, there's, and I think this is one of the cases where we, we need better uh, research data because we can say that there's a, um, a correlation between the increased demand for police and shale gas drilling, <laughs> but we can't uh, posit a, ca a causation. So uh, this is an example of something where we really do need research, but there we can show some correlations that in the communities that have had shell gas drilling, they have had to hire more police, and this is happening in, in uh, Bradford County. Um, increased demand for health and education services for obvious reasons. You've got population increase, and you're going to have, you've got a, a heavy industry where people are going to be injured. There's going to be incidents, um, and those demands are going to go up. Increased demand on public administrative services, permitting, zoning, um, planning. Um, I must say that it's kind of ironic when, when Ben was talking to begin with. The one profession that this seems to have been a tremendous boon for is lawyers. <laughs> if you look at the pie charts of, um, uh, of occupations that have grown in shale gas communities, lawyers are 
up there. Um, and then there's going to be new service requirements, such as emergency response capacity and environmental monitoring and remediation. So there's going to have to be people who are in the business of, of checking on what's going on. The question is, how is this going to be paid for? Who's going to pay for it? At what level is it going to be done? These are costs. These are real costs. And the larger the number of wells in a shorter period of time, the higher the costs are. The second question is this question of regional impacts. And as I said, um, I'm an economic geographer. I'm somebody, this is a perfect topic for an economic geographer, actually. It combines the environment. Uh, I, geography is about human environment interface. And so um, uh, there's a question, and I've always been interested in regional, regional, the regional dimension of, of economic development um, and regional issues in um, the economy. So um, when I looked at this, I could see that there was going to be um, these localities that would go through fast boom bust cycles, one after another, not, and then not necessarily where there's going to be um, impacts from um, regional infrastructure. We're going to get trucks in Ithaca even if we don't have drilling. We're going to get, um, in, in Watkins Glen where I was on Wednesday, they're anticipating an energy, uh, energy uh, facility for natural gas storage that is an immense uh, industrial facility with a, um, I think, 14-acre brine pond that will go next to Seneca Lake. Um, um, so there are going to be regional impacts. I'll just list the kinds of things that are going to take place in the region. We know about pipelines, that's going to be, and pipelines are not, they're covered by the Public Service Commission, and so they, we, they are not um, covered under the S guys. Um, man camps, there are man camps developing in housing. There's tremendous impacts on housing, and oil and gas companies uh, have to, if they're going to have their, the workers work, um, and they work very hard, seven days a week, 12 hours a day, um, they have to have uh, housing and so these temporary housing facilities um, are, are established. Water extraction sites, um, compressor plants which are very uh, noisy and um, uh, have air pollution problems. Uh, we, uh, we really need to know more about those compressor plants and where they're going to be. Um, Staging sites, if you go into Pennsylvania, you'll see um, truck uh, depots and staging sites for the, for the drilling crews. Uh, rail spurs, there's a rail spur planned for uh, the energy site in Watkins Glen. Um, and trucks, 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 lots of trucks because they're going to be carrying all this from one place to another. Um, so the last topic that I wanted to make some uh, m mention is um, what can we expect um, in the long term from this? Now, um, the evidence on, on this is also very controversial because some people would say, again, that this is going to be a boom without a bust. Um, I just find that ridiculous. Um, this is a natural resource extraction industry, and so when it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> um, and so what we're, again, if you can visualize this, place, place, place with drilling, not necessarily where the infrastructure is located, a regional industrial infrastructure with lots of different facilities, um, and then uh, after a period of time, a drop-off. There will be a drop-off. And the question is, okay, are we prepared for that? What, what is going to happen during that drop-off? Um, the evidence we have from other shale plays and from other um, natural resource regions uh, suggests that particularly rural areas have poor outcomes after uh, resource extraction. Um, and, and the reasons for this will make sense to you. They're very 
they're very reasonable. They aren't exotic reasons. Um, these communities get vol uh, revenue in a volatile stream. They get a windfall one year, and they may, if, uh, if they're abiding by uh, good accounting standards, they may have to spend that money all in that year. They can't put it in a kitty and save it. This is one thing I think that, ha that local governments have to look at very carefully. Um, there's a phenomenon called crowding out, which happens in many of these communities, where the price of housing goes up, the price of labor goes up. We're already experiencing this in New York, where the price of uh, the cost of uh, transporting milk is going up because the milk distribution companies can't hire drivers because the drivers are moving to the to work for the trucks, the oil and gas truck trucking. Um, so what this does is this crowding out works against diversification in the local economy. It also may particularly harm certain industries. And we are doing a study of tourism. But tourism may be a particularly vulnerable industry in this context um, because of the effect of the uh, industrial landscape. And um, because, for example, when your hotels are full of drilling crew workers, the birders don't have any place. You know, so this is. And, and then they'll learn to go someplace else. So this is, we're talking about the long term. Um, as I said, um, also there's a, 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 when you get that downturn, the production phase, uh, after the drilling phase, when you're just monitoring the wells and production, there are actually very few jobs available. They, they're, they're good jobs. They're, they're pretty good jobs. They pay good wages, and they're, they're jobs mon doing monitoring and maintenance. But there are very few of them. So these regions have generally not done pretty well, done very well. Um, the, there's some evidence from a group called the Headwaters uh, Project in Colorado. And Colorado has done, I have, I have to say, of the states that have really paid attention to this, both environmentally and in terms of public health and ec the economic side, Colorado, I think, has done the best. Um, the um, counties where there is, uh, shale gas drilling, or natu I should say natural resource extraction, have ended up with less economic diversity than other counties in the state. They haven't been able to attract, for example, the retirement communities. <laughs> Their tour, you know, the tourism, you know, it's, I mean, as I said, this isn't, this isn't rocket science. This is everything we could understand. People don't want to live next to a compressor plant or have trucks going down their road every minute. Um, and um, so they've had less ability to attract investment in other industries. Um, they have modestly per outperformed their peer counties uh, in growth earnings per job. So the jobs that are left during the production phase, for example, are good jobs. In a place like Chautauqua County in New York, where we've had drilling, this seems to be the case. The population has declined. The county is one of the poorest in New York. Um, there are some good jobs there, um, but there's also increasing. It has inequality has increased. So the other thing to remember with this is that there are new winners and new losers. And um, so inequality seems to be characteristic. Increased inequality compared to other kinds of similar counties seems to be a be characteristic. Now, I wanted to say one thing. This is also from my, my being a geographer. <laughs> um, there's something that geographers study called agglomeration economies. And that is, um, the, uh, geographers are interested in where industries concentrate and um, how they uh, interact uh, for example, with their subcontractors, service industries. If you think about Hollywood, and, I, and as Ben said, I've studied the, the media industries. If you think about Hollywood, this is a good example of this. People go to Hollywood because that's where they can get a job, because they're working project to project, and they're, they're, uh, the expertise is there. So that's a, an easy model for us to understand. The oil and gas industry is like Hollywood. <laughs> in the sense that as production increases in New York and Pennsylvania, we will get production jobs, drilling jobs, you know, other kinds of jobs. 
But the growth of the good jobs, the geologists, the engineers, the high-powered lawyers, the headquarters, will be in Houston. And we've measured this, and I think it's very interesting. Now, uh, it's, it's because that's the headquarters of the industry. So as it expands, um, that's where the growth in the good jobs will be. And there's very good evidence on this, from, from the industry itself, actually. So OK, I want, just want to finish up and to say that um, when we look at the long term, if you want to be totally practical about this, and prepare for that bust and say that bust is going to come. Um, as I said, the long-term implications are uncertain. We really don't know. We don't have good data right now. Uh, we're benefiting. I think New York has benefited enormously from the moratorium. We've got gatherings like this. People have engaged. Um, there's a lot of concern about um, c controversy and people arguing with each other. And, but I, I have seen that gradually diminish, actually. I think people are actually getting very sophisticated in the kinds of questions they ask. They show up. They, they're, they're learning. They're trying to engage at a completely different level. It's, just, it's not like, I'm for this. I'm against this. Now it's, OK, w what will this entail? What does this mean? You can still end up being for it or against it, of course. But people are engaging in a much more sophisticated way. Um, but I think that we still don't have sufficient information to assess what the long-term risks are, environmentally or economically. We, in New York, we have the benefit. We can learn from Pennsylvania. but. Um, as I said, there are going to be new winners, but also losers. And the losers are going to include some businesses, poor people who can't pay rent, and some industries like tourism. So we have to understand what this entails. Um, OK, now, um, finally, I think the question becomes a question we all have. How do we deal with a non-renewable resource? There's actually little precedent for success, long-term success with this. Um, so OK, what do I say? I'm, 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 I'm an odd professor because I'm willing to make recommendations. <laughs> That's part of why the foundation wanted me to do this, is that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in helping people think about this in the real world, not just in the classroom or in the academic journal. OK, the conclusion I've come to is to take it slow to minimize cumulative impacts. The slower this goes, the slower the pace and scale, the more communities will be able to control what happens and adapt and, and, and deal with the costs. The state has to be required, and the state, the state is the place where the action is. We have to the state has to be able to move on this and make policies. We can talk in our communities until the cows come home, but the people here, and there are many people here, have gone to Albany, keep going. Um, the state has to be transparent about incidents, about um, where the drilling is occurring, about um, who, about the sources of taxes, who's making decisions about uh, tax rates. Uh, the oil and gas companies at this point in, in the taxes in New York State, they self-report. Nobody even monitors how much gas they're getting out of the ground. I mean, we need better monitoring and transparency so people can actively engage. Um, the other thing I would say is because this is a regional phenomenon, it's really important that communities start to interact with each other. There has to be uh, cooperation across counties, across municipalities, to try to minimize the negative impacts and from the industrial infrastructure in particular. And, um, and also thinking carefully. I do think that natural gas is an asset to our communities. But I would like to see us use that asset here. It's our asset. 
pardon me for being chauv chauvinistic, but I'm somebody, you know, I'm the uh, New York State economic development lady, so if I didn't say that, <laughs> um, who would? Um, I think there are ways, for example, district heating, uh, Corning Inc. is using the, its own natural gas. I think we can use that natural gas uh, as a transitional uh, energy source. Um, if we don't, it's going to be used for us. So I, I think we need to plan for that. And that would have a longer time frame, potentially uh, in, in encouraging manufacturing and other activities. Okay, then I think that the final thing we obviously have to understand is when it's gone, it's gone. It's not like water. New York has used water as a wonderful renewable energy resource. We, we are the water capital of the world. We have to protect our water. Our water is our most important thing. And uh, we've used it uh, not very well, in my opinion, but we have used it for economic development. Um, natural gas is not like that. When it's gone, it's gone. So we have to be very careful and wise about how we see it exploited and used. And um, um, understand what the interests are uh, driving how fast the drilling takes place and over what time. So I will leave you with that. And I will be around uh, during the day, even we're not going to have um, questions because this panel is going to start. But um, I'll be around and I'd be happy to answer questions. And again, uh, our results are going to be on our website. So thank you very much. <laughs>